Vancouver. 72 Sierra is entering the crater with three on board. Vancouver copies. And can I have a report on weather conditions and plume for the gas plane? Sure can, Vancouver. The winds are light, no clouds. The plume is rising to about 9,000 feet and drifting to the southeast. Thanks, 72. Sounds good. Also, you've got another crew in about a half an hour, three people, and they'll be working at gauge stations in the Toodle River and at Spirit Lake. Roger that, Vancouver. I'm dropping the crew on the west side of the dome now, and I'm on my way to the staging area for the river crew. KOD 305. A mile wide and 2,000 feet deep, the horseshoe-shaped crater of Mount St. Helens is a spectacular display of a volcano. Layer after layer of volcanic ash and lava flows exposed in the crater walls are testimonies of past eruptions and a reminder that Mount St. Helens has been erupting for thousands of years. Scientists have been working in this formidable place since its formation in 1980 to study the eruptive activity of Mount St. Helens. It's an eerie landscape, barren and desolate, where just a few years ago, an entire mountain stood. Both the crater and Toodle River crews are part of the Cascades Volcano Observatory established in Vancouver, Washington. More than 50 scientists and technicians of the United States Geological Survey work here to study the volcano and to monitor the hydrologic hazards caused by its recent activity. The scientists give warning to public officials when they see signs that signal eruptive activity and determine flood hazards to communities downstream from the volcano. Mount St. Helens volcano used to be compared in beauty to the famous Mount Fuji in Japan because its symmetrical snow-covered cone towered above the surrounding forest and nearby Spirit Lake. Mount St. Helens is one of several large stratovolcanoes that dominate the Cascade Range between Northern California and Southern British Columbia. Scattered along the Cascades are scores of volcanoes ranging in size from small cinder cones to the massive glacier-covered peak of Mount Rainier. The current activity of Mount St. Helens began in March 1980. A magnitude 4 earthquake on March 20 was followed by two months of intense earthquake activity and periodic steam blast eruptions that formed a summit crater more than 1,000 feet in diameter. These events were caused by the upward movement of magma or molten rock into the volcano. The intruding magma caused the north side of the volcano to move outward more than 300 feet, creating the famous bulge. On May 18, 1980, a magnitude 5.1 earthquake shook loose the bulge on the volcano's north flank resulting in the largest known landslide in historic time. Described by an aerial observer as rippling and churning, the north side of the summit began sliding along a deep-seated slide plane to the north. The sudden removal of the north flank released pressure within the volcano and triggered a devastating lateral blast to the north. The abrupt pressure release, or uncorking of the volcano by the avalanche, is similar in some ways to the removal of the cap from a vigorously shaken bottle of soda pop. The blast of rock, ash, and gas traveling more than 200 miles an hour with temperatures estimated as high as 600 degrees Fahrenheit devastated an area of 230 square miles. Trees were stripped from most hillsides within six miles north of the volcano and vegetation leveled up to 13 miles away. 
Within minutes, a mushroom-shaped ash cloud had risen to 70,000 feet above sea level. And by late afternoon, ash was reported falling in Montana, Wyoming, and other western states. Ejected volcanic debris, some of it saturated with water, mixed with melting snow and ice, and formed mud flows. The mud flows raced down river valleys, destroying roads, bridges, and homes. The most devastating eruption in the history of the United States caused widespread destruction, killed 57 people, and transformed one of the most scenic alpine landscapes of the Cascade Range into a desolate, barren wasteland. Mount St. Helens has erupted many times since the eruption of May 18th and has given geologists the chance to directly observe volcanic rocks as they are being formed and to study the deposits produced by different kinds of volcanic activity. The volcano erupted explosively five more times during the summer and fall of 1980. Each of the eruptions were smaller than the events of May 18th, producing columns of ash 30,000 feet above sea level and hot, dry, pyroclastic flows of pumice and ash that swept down the north flank of the volcano as fast as 100 miles an hour. Pyroclastic flows are fast-moving, dense flows of gas, pumice, and ash formed by the fragmentation of magma and rock by explosive activity. The flows deposited ash and pumice fragments north of the crater in fan-like patterns, and temperatures were measured as high as 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Since 1980, a lava dome has formed in the crater by more than a dozen eruptions. Domes are formed by thick, pasty masses of lava, too sticky to flow very far from the vent. Lava of the Mount St. Helens Dome is about a million times thicker or stickier than the basalt lava erupted at Kilauea Volcano on the island of Hawaii because it contains a higher percentage of silica. Consequently, the lava at Mount St. Helens flows slowly and piles up right around the eruptive vent. A dome building eruption can be compared to what happens when a balloon is being filled with water and some of the water leaks out. Magma that rises into the dome may push part of the dome outward as much as 150 feet before it finally finds its way to the surface. When magma appears at the surface, it's called lava and typically it forms a tongue or lobe on top of the dome that creeps down one side over a period of several days. Sometimes the lava forms a stiff spine. These have grown as high as 200 feet before crumbling as they cool and become brittle. Like other active volcanoes, Mount St. Helens continuously emits volcanic gas from fumaroles on and around the lava dome. More than 90% of the gas is water vapor that may form a visible plume of condensed steam, especially during cold winter months. Occasionally, vigorous emissions of gas from the dome produce small ashy plumes that may rise a few thousand feet above the crater rim. These plumes are normal activity at Mount St. Helens, and they do not increase the hazards outside of the crater. Scientists of the Cascades Volcano Observatory and the University of Washington Geophysics Program use a variety of methods to study and predict eruptions at Mount St. Helens. Earthquakes are recorded by six seismometers on the volcano and ten others within 20 miles of Mount St. Helens. Seismologists keep a close watch on the number and type of earthquakes that occur beneath the volcano. Prior to each new eruption, the number of earthquakes that are counted shows a systematic increase. The increase in earthquake activity before eruptions has aided in making predictions a few hours to a few days in advance. 
Following the May 18, 1980 eruption, geologists re-established a detailed survey network around the volcano to measure any swelling that might occur before future eruptions. One scientist working on the project explains. Uh, we were also making measurements into the crater from Harry's Ridge, which is about five miles north of the crater. These measurements were showing us that the crater floor itself was moving toward the north very much more rapidly than the outer flanks of the volcano. Scientists knew from these movements that additional measurements would be needed from inside the dangerous crater. Well, the risks from being in a crater are that there could be an unexpected explosion that might eject hot dome rocks onto the crater floor, or there could be rock falls from the walls of the crater which are very steep and high. And during wintertime, there could be snow avalanches off those walls. Of course, once uh, a dome began forming in the crater, there was the added danger of rocks rolling off of it. Accepting these risks, scientists work in the crater of Mount St. Helens several times each week to measure changes that are taking place. At the end of each field day, data are brought back to the observatory where they are studied and compared with the previous day's measurements. By observing patterns of ground movement in the crater, scientists have been able to recognize the beginnings of an eruption one to three weeks in advance. During the first two years after the May 18th eruption, cracks often appeared on the crater floor before eruptions and extended outward from the dome like spokes of a wheel. Glowing rock was visible in some cracks and temperatures of escaping gas were measured as high as 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Measurements with a steel tape showed that cracks widened with time, especially just before an eruption. Parts of the crater floor often became slightly wrinkled several weeks before eruptions. A few of these wrinkles developed into unusual features called thrust faults, sometimes growing from less than one foot high to as high as 10 to 15 feet within a few days of an eruption. The movement of the crater floor along these faults increases before eruptions. And by measuring the rate of movement, scientists discovered a reliable and consistent means for predicting eruptions at Mount St. Helens. A painted orange line best shows the development of a thrust fault over a period of several days. While rock falls from the dome and crater walls have buried most of the ground cracks and thrust faults, another technique for prediction has also been used. Surveys of the dome with a theodolite and electronic distance meter show that the dome swells slowly as magma moves up into it. This magma continues to rise until it reaches the surface and erupts as lava. This technique provides valuable information on the rates of internal dome growth and is used to predict lava extrusions. In addition to these ground measurements, gases are collected from the lava dome and crater fumaroles and carefully analyzed for changes. Sulfur dioxide gas in the plume is frequently measured by instruments mounted in an airplane to help understand current conditions at the volcano. Rock samples are also collected after each eruption and provide information about chemical changes that may be occurring in the magma reservoir beneath the volcano. Vancouver, 72 Sierra has the Tootle River crew on board and we're headed for the Elk Rock gauging station first before going to Spirit Lake. Vancouver copy, 72. While some scientists have been monitoring the eruptive activity, Others have been working in the river valleys around Mount St. Helens to study the effects of the May 18th devastating eruption and to determine flood hazards to communities downstream from the volcano. The severely altered landscape of down timber and debris covered hillsides have increased how quickly water flows into and down the river valleys during a rainstorm and consequently have increased the amounts of material eroded and transported downstream. 
The eruption also increased the availability of easily erodible sediment by depositing loose volcanic debris over a wide area north of the volcano, especially in the North Fork of the Tudor River. More than three billion cubic yards of rock, ash, and snow from the avalanche slid north into Spirit Lake and west 13 miles down the North Fork of the Tudor River. The avalanche deposit buries the Old Valley floor with up to 600 feet of unconsolidated volcanic rocks that are easily eroded. The lateral blast deposited an additional 250 million cubic yards of loose debris in valleys and on hillsides north of the volcano. Water that previously soaked into the ground or was evaporated and transpired by vegetation now flows directly into the river system, carrying with it large amounts of soil, ash, and organic material. Erosion in the form of landslides and gullies began soon after the May 18th eruption and has eroded pumice and ash that were erupted hundreds or thousands of years ago, as well as the material erupted in 1980. Channels 1,000 feet wide and more than 150 feet deep have been carved out by erosion in the avalanche deposit. This material is transported downstream by the Toodle River where it is deposited in the lower Toodle and Cowlitz rivers. By filling in the bottom of a river channel, the sediment reduces the size of the channel and thus increases the possibility of bank overflow and floods during winter rains or from volcanic mud flows. In typical mountain streams of the Cascades, boulders and cobbles form pools and riffles along stream channels. These boulders create friction and turbulence along the bottom of the channel so that the stream's velocity is greatly reduced near the bottom. The roughness along the bottom of the Tudor River is much less because of the smaller size of rock particles that are eroded and transported by the river. This increases the velocity of the current, which in turn increases the ability of the Toodle and Cowlitz River to transport sediment. These factors make the sediment yield of the Toodle River among the highest in the world and presents flood hazards that will continue to be of concern for decades. The Geological Survey continuously record water discharge and the volume of sediment transported by rivers draining the volcano. This information is used by local governments and other federal agencies to evaluate the flood hazards. The Army Corps of Engineers is developing a long-term strategy for minimizing these hazards to communities along the Toodle and Cowlitz rivers. Dredging sediment out of these rivers and dike construction along their banks are some of the projects now underway to reduce the possibility of flooding. Vancouver, 72 Sierra is off Elk Rock with the Toodle River crew and headed for Spirit Lake. Copy, 72 Sierra. In addition to being a large source of easily erodible sediment, the avalanche dammed Spirit Lake to a higher level and blocked tributaries of the Toodle River to form new lakes, such as Coldwater and Castle Lake. Concerns by public officials over the rising water levels in the lakes and the stability of the dams have led to the construction of outlet channels and pumping water out of Spirit Lake by the Army Corps of Engineers. The pumping has stabilized the level of Spirit Lake until a permanent tunnel is drilled through a ridge on the west side of the lake and into a tributary of the Toodle River. The geological survey has installed an early warning system that monitors the water levels of the lakes and provides an emergency warning if one of the debris dams were to fail and release water that could flood even more area than did the mud flows on May 18, 1980. Geologic studies of the dams, however, indicate that they are unlikely to fail under current conditions.
Many things are being learned at Mount St. Helens that are useful in the study of other volcanoes. It's important to identify specific hazards associated with a volcano before any eruptive activity begins. The recent activity at Mount St. Helens has helped geologists recognize and understand volcanic deposits that were formed in the past and other volcanoes in the world. By observing eruptive activity in the present and studying deposits formed in the past, scientists can better estimate the hazards associated with future volcanic eruptions. Monitoring earthquakes and ground movements on other volcanoes will probably record changes before such activity, but in most cases will not define the exact time or nature of potential eruptions as precisely as is now possible at Mount St. Helens. The Geological Survey is monitoring other Cascade volcanoes such as Mount Rainier and Lassen Peak. Such monitoring will be important in providing warnings of future eruptions at these and other Cascade volcanoes. Mount St. Helens has been erupting for thousands of years and will probably continue erupting for thousands more. What will Mount St. Helens look like in 20, 50, 100 years? No one really knows, but perhaps the lava dome will continue to grow and fill the crater, such as Bezemeyani volcano in the Soviet Union, or return to a quiet, restful period, only to erupt again for future generations.